Amen. Be strong. Be the head of the home. These words have haunted me for a very long time. What do they even mean? Let's go back to the beginning. I grew up very privileged. I went to a private school in a private car. We lived in our own private home with our own private driveway. I played golf on weekends, and I began driving way before the legal age. And why not? The cars were there. Then, on November 2000, my father was diagnosed with stomach cancer. The doctor said they had to perform a small routine operation to remove the growth. And that's it. All would be well. It's funny how some things are simply said. He stayed in hospital for three months, moving from ICU to the ward and back. We became residents of the hospital. Every day, my brother, sister, and I would go and visit him. Unfortunately, on 12 February 2001, he breathed his last. Life, as we are known it, came to an end. We experienced a cocktail of emotions, numbness, disbelief, resentment, anger, pain. Even though we sensed all would not end well, we were not ready for it. When someone stays in hospital for that long, your mind begins to wonder, what if? What if they die? What if today could be the last day? That what if came on 12 February 2001. After he passed, people came with all sorts of advice and words of encouragement. They said, be a man, be strong, be the head of the home. I was only 16 years old. What does it mean to be a man, to be strong, and to be the head of the home? People said it, but no one ever showed me. My father was an alpha male. He was that guy who overcame the mediocrity of the village, got educated, and made something of himself. He was an outstanding African man. However, like most African men, his silence was outstanding. <laughs> you had to read his body language to determine what he was thinking and feeling. He did not share any life experiences, pass on any life skills, show any weakness or any emotions. His job was to get things done, and getting things done, he did. I struggled with many things after my father passed. For example, when we used to go for functions, when he was alive, I'd walk behind him, people would ask, whose child are you? I would probably reply, engineer Chapoin. He knew people, and they knew him. They didn't know us. After he passed on, I'd go to functions, and I'd see other families coming in, and I'd get so jealous. They could go to a function as a complete family. We would just go as us. Also, as is the normal African families, his death was followed by a fight for resources. And following this fight, we lost quite a lot. At the time, my siblings and I were in prestigious national schools. Following this fight, the future was uncertain. We moved from having four cars to zero cars in a span of three years. We moved from our leafy suburban home to a three-room apartment. We moved from having up country farms to no farms at all. We moved from knowing everybody and being so networked to not knowing anybody. In a society, when a family loses their father, the doors and networks close. I struggled with many things after my father passed. I struggled with career choices, how to live and behave as a teenager in the adult world. I especially struggled with religion. For years, people said it was God's will, that God loved him more. But what about my will? What about my love? By God's grace, my mother put food on the table, and she got us educated. She also offered advice. But for a growing man, 
There's some advice you need to get from your father, from another man. For example, when it came to dating, I was clueless. So I did what does my father do? I was distant, I was quiet, <laughs> I was emotionless. <laughs> this did not work. <laughs> so I began reading books on dating and flirting. <laughs> yes, there are books on dating and flirting. You can thank me later. <laughs> this helped for a while. Then on 29th December 2011, I saw her. Her name was Shiko with an S. <laughs> she didn't know who I was. I didn't even know who I was, but I knew she was the one. My reading on dating and flirting got me a date. Hooray! <laughs> and I continued to get several dates for the next two years. After several months of thought and prayer, I decided it was time to propose. I asked, and she said yes. My first hurdle was done. Now on to my second hurdle. I now needed a man to come and represent me as we began the process. I'll not forget picking up the phone to call an uncle of mine who had not talked to me for quite a while. I now needed him. I needed a father figure. When I called him, he was more than willing to help. In fact, he went over and above to ensure that the whole wedding and wife procurement process went well. <laughs> and I'm forever grateful. <laughs> we got married, and two years later, we had a baby. Before the baby, all was well. It was like dating with the approval of church, family, and society. Huh? Our relationship was legitimate. But with a baby, I was clueless. When you break the news to people, they congratulate you for the, big, for the news that you're expecting, and they give you the rules. Just work hard and provide. On 3rd August 2016, my beautiful baby daughter was born. I was in hospital holding her, this cute little baby that I made. And I thought, no, no. This baby is going to depend on me for the next 18 years. <laughs> School fees, food, clothes, diapers. How am I going to do it? How am I going to provide? My wife also depending on me to be a father, a present father. On the inside, negative bank balances were flashing in my mind. Will I be a good father? Will I provide? How will I do it? At the time, I was a consultant running my own business. And every business owner knows this. Cash flow is not guaranteed. I'll never forget a day I was driving home from work, sitting in traffic, and the fuel light had been on for quite a while. And I had 30 shillings on my phone. And I asked myself, how? How would I get here? How do I get out? I did the typical man thing. I told no one. I used to stop by Costalata Church, sit in the garden or in the church, and wonder what next. This became my routine. I would stop by the church, recruit myself, before I go home to be the happy spiritual father. If you met me at the time, you'd never know. I was in character. I believe this is a struggle many men face today. No one tells you how to handle it. All you're told is, be a man, be strong, be the head of the home. Or, one in effort. <laughs> hmm? So I began asking other men, how are they handling it? How are they coping? How are they doing it? The more men I asked, I discovered the secret. There was none. <laughs> I asked older men, they were clueless. I asked religious people, they told me to pray. How could it be that all these men who I thought had it together be clueless? So I took matters into my own hands. I formed a men's forum 
for a few husbands and fathers to share openly. We set the rules, and no topic was off limit. I was not doing this for them. I was doing this for me. I needed it. My wife needed it, and my baby needed it even more. The first few meetings were odd, but when he began sharing, it was amazing to see the depth of this man. And this is the same as all men. Inside all of us are all these fears and ambitions that are unsaid. We've been told that we can't say certain things or feel a certain way. We're supposed to have it all together. Yet there are many times we do not. As the men's forum continued to meet, we continued to keep each other in check. There's a particular time when I was very unsure about the future. I felt I had no support from my wife and I had a plan. In my mind, all my wife was doing was churning out a list of things that needed to be bought. <laughs> Everything was on me. After dwelling on the topic quite a while, I talked to the men's forum about it. They quickly put me in my place. They knew my wife and they told me to go talk to her. After dwelling on the topic for so long, this group of men that I trusted were telling me to go talk, like really? <laughs> I gathered the courage, and I went home and talked to my wife. I told her how I was unsure about the future, but I had a plan. And then I sat back, and waited for a response. What would you say? What would you think? Would you think less of me as a man? That moment seemed like eternity. She turned to me and said, I understand. In fact, I've been working on a couple of things. She went on to tell me how, what she had been planning, and how she'll be waiting for me to address the topic. There are a few words that can soothe a man's heart. Those first two words she said, I understand, really soothe my heart. I realized that as men, we live in isolation. We meet, we party, we mingle, we walk tall, talk big and dream even bigger, yet we don't do the one thing that we need to do the most. We meet and talk about business, sports, and women, yet we never share what we're really going through. We project an aura of bravado, yet we are suffering. Our fathers did it, and so do we. It is time for us men to take a different approach. If only men would share their fears and share their challenges to other men, that would help them be better fathers than husbands. If only men would drop the title in front of their loved ones, that would help them understand them better. That would help their wives understand them better. It is fine to be a man, to be strong, and to be the head of the home. But it is even better to be real, open, and honest. It is better to share. If only men would come together, great things would happen. <laughs>